Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In his book, American Reckoning, the Vietnam War and American Identity, Christian Oppie writes, the need to demonstrate presidential balls has been an under-acknowledged but enduring staple of American foreign policy. Aggressive masculinity shaped American Cold War policy and still does. Deep-seated ideas about gender and sexuality cannot be dismissed as mere talk. They have explanatory value. U.S. policy in Vietnam was driven by men who were intensely concerned about demonstrating their own and the nation's toughness. As every other justification of the war grew threadbare, it became increasingly important to appear firm. Now joining us in the studio is Christian Appy. Thanks for joining us again. You're welcome. So one more time, his latest book is American Reckoning, the Vietnam War and Our National Identity. And Christian teaches history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So uh, this has always seemed to me this need to develop, uh, portray firmness and strength and so on. Um, you know, it's, it's akin to like a loan shark, and it's actually a lot akin to a loan shark, given how much of American commerce is based on lending people money, and I shouldn't say people, lending countries money, and uh, assuming they're going to pay back. And, uh, the, you know, for most loan sharks, you've got to break some knees once in a while to make sure people pay you the exorbitant interest you're trying to collect. Um, but talk about this, this need to project toughness and start with Kennedy in Vietnam. Well, Kennedy, early on in his presidency, suffered a couple of real blows to his reputation, most obviously when he supported the, uh, orchestrated the invasion of Cuba in an effort to overthrow Castro, which, uh, at the Bay of Pigs, and it was a debacle and it failed. Every one of the Cuban exiles that was trained to carry out the operation was either killed or captured. And, uh, Kennedy was forced to actually pay ransom to get the prisoners back. So it, uh, it, what was uh, to be a secret operation was quickly exposed and it was felt it, he felt it as deeply humiliating. And then uh, later that same year, he met for the first time with Khrushchev uh, and um, Khrushchev uh, effectively kind of bullied him. And once again, uh, Kennedy felt um, that he had not demonstrated uh, his you know, presidential gravitas. And I was already beginning to look at foreign policy interventions. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Add yeah. Internally, yeah. taking tremendous flack from sections, of, some sections of the military, and certainly the whole conservative pun, punderapis, yeah. uh, pun, punderarap, <laughs> can't say it, but you yeah. know what I mean, uh, about being weak. Yes. I mean, why didn't he go in with a full-fledged invasion of Cuba? Right. Uh, that, and uh, he was already beginning to sort of move toward a, a neutralist solution to the communist insurgency in Laos. So he was beginning to think that maybe, maybe Vietnam would be the place to assert American credibility uh, and power. But uh, before that really be began to develop, uh, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this for, for him was a, 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 a great boost to his reputation and to his reputation for strength and Again, steely Again, really quickly, re some resolve. of our viewers don't know what that is. Yeah, well, uh, the United States um, discovered uh, through um, uh, um, U-2 reconnaissance uh, photographs that the Soviet there Union, was a spy plane. the spy plane, that uh, the Soviet Union was beginning to install um, medium-range nuclear missiles uh, in Cuba. Uh, in, in response, actually, to the U.S.-backed invasion, they were, they were put there as a kind of deterrent, uh, def uh, really defensive, though, of course, all nuclear weapons are almost by definition and also there were nuclear, dangerous. The United States had weapons in Turkey, in the, the, which we were had, awfully close we, to exactly. Russia. Exactly. And indeed, you, you speak to what the, the exact resolution of the, the missile crisis. Uh, Kennedy made clear on television that it would not be tolera tolerated. Interestingly enough, uh, it, it, he couldn't tolerate it because he had made a speech a couple of months earlier saying that if offensive weapons were put on Cuba by the Soviet Union, uh, he, he would not allow that. And once it happened, well, he asked some advisors, does this really change the balance of power in the world? And Kennedy said, uh, McNamara said no, Secretary of Defense McNamara. And Kennedy agreed. He said, I, I wish I had never said that. I wish I had never, you know, put, drawn that line. Yeah, because what could they do with them? Yeah, so... Uh, he had, but now he felt he had to do something, and what he did, uh, thankfully, was to be a little patient and to uh, say no to those uh, of his advisors that immediately wanted to launch airstrikes and take a more aggressive response. 
they negotiated a settlement. So it really was diplomacy, not bluster or, uh, or militarism that solved the crisis. They were willing to say to the Soviets, okay, we will publicly promise never to invade Cuba and privately will agree to remove our missiles from Turkey that are threatening uh, very close to your borders. But the narrative that they wanted to go out to the public was a tougher uh, narrative uh, that we, uh, we uh, stared them eyeball to eyeball and the other fellow blinked. That was uh, attributed right, to- uh, America set up all these back. military ships, Navy yes, ships the sort as a of blockade the, the, around the, the, Cuba. The, yes, the quarantine. And um, they, Kennedy even went so far as to suggest that Adlai Stevenson, who was uh, representing us in the, uh, at the United Nations, had wanted to sell us out, had wanted a quote unquote Munich because he had advised that we remove our missiles from Turkey to solve the crisis. And that's exactly what did solve the crisis, but Kennedy didn't want anybody to know that, so he actually threw Stevenson under the bus as a, as a, as a weakling. Anyway, he privately he told people that uh, Kennedy bragged to, in private to friends that he had cut off Khrushchev's balls. Uh, so that, that that really, that really is deeply embedded in uh, the American foreign policy um, of the period, and it becomes more important, as I write, as the other justifications for the war uh, are no longer believed, even by the policymakers. By 1965 or 1966, I, I believe, uh, Johnson was not convinced that uh, the war in Vietnam posed any threat to national security. I want, I want to get to okay. Johnson, yeah. but I just want to stay on Kennedy okay, for a sure. minute. Okay, sure. You know, there's a lot of the debate about the Kennedy assassination. <clears throat> That's whether or not he was really going to pursue Vietnam or not. What, what's your take? Well, you know, I waffle on this issue. As I tell students, it's hard enough as a historian to figure out what actually happens and nearly impossible to figure out what might have happened if X or Y or Z had, had been different. So the, really, these are interesting speculations, but really impossible to nail down. The truth is there's a documentary evidence that would support both positions. I mean. Uh, those who would like to believe that Kennedy would have, would have pulled us out of Vietnam can cite documents where they're talking about a withdrawing a thousand troops at a time and slowly dra drawing down our presence. But, but Kennedy was pretty clear in a lot of those, um, uh, that planning, that, that, that those withdrawals would, had to be contingent on success. Uh, and there was some hope at the time that maybe we, we, their success was coming, but um, it needs to be rem uh, remembered that uh, Kennedy, although he never uh, put more than 16,000 troops into Vietnam, which seems quite a small number when you compare it to the 540,000 that finally ended up there under Johnson, those 16,000 troops were, had already put into place many brutal uh, practices that would only get expanded. We were, by 1962, we were already using chemi chemical defoliants on South Vietnam. We were using napalm. We were engaged in aerial bombing of South Vietnam, the very land we claimed to be defending. Uh, and we were already beginning uh, the forced relocation of people from the rural countryside into um, what were then called strategic hamlets. Concentration camps. Effectively concentration camps. So all of that had begun. And even on the last day of his life, he, was, he gave a speech that morning, or maybe it was the night before, I think it was that morning, uh, in, in which he re reaffirmed the necessity of America's standing against communist aggression in South Vietnam. Now, it was to a Texas audience, but he did tick off all the ways in which we had uh, built up the military and work. I, I interviewed Gore Vidal a few times and, uh, he, and got to know him fairly well, and he knew Jack Kennedy, President Kennedy, fairly well. Uh, he, I think he was a, a step-brother to Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. Um, and he said he was quite convinced that that Jack, and this goes back to you got to have balls theme. Mm -hmm. He was quite convinced that Jack wanted to pursue the war in Vietnam, and to a large extent, to prove he could be a wartime president. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe mm -hmm. uh, that he had the balls to go to war in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But as you say, this becomes a much even bigger issue for for Johnson. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to read a quote from your book. Sure. By 1966, Assistant Secretary of Defense John McNaughton concluded that avoiding humiliation had moved from 70% of America's goal in Vietnam to 100%. Quote, the reasons why we went into Vietnam to the present depth are varied, but they are now largely academic. Why we have not withdrawn is, by all odds, one reason, to preserve our reputation. We have not hung on to save a friend or to den deny the communists the added acres and heads. 
Christian writes, to preserve an image of strength, LBJ systematically escalated the war. Perhaps the most shocking moment in Robert Dalek's biography of Johnson comes when a group of reporters pressed by LBJ to explain why he continued to wage war in spite of so many difficulties and so much opposition. The president, quote, unzipped his fly, drew out his substantial organ and declared, quote, this is why. Other key policymakers may not have displayed their genitals, but all the men who sent America to Vietnam felt a deep connection between their own masculinity and national power. Expand a bit. Well, it's true. I mean, uh, the, uh, the group of policymakers did not share Johnson's uh, crudity, at least, uh, <laughs> or his uh, poorer background in, from the hill countries of Texas. Uh, they come from really a different class background, many of them very privileged private schools, Ivy League colleges, elite military service. Uh, all men's metropolitan clubs, secret societies, that whole world inbred a kind of code of masculinity that made the um, you know, pers personal toughness inseparable from the toughness of the state. And, and so uh, they, they really did um, uh, own that idea that uh, it was their mission, kind of a Spartan mission, uh, to uh, uphold American strength and that any, anybody who questioned that could not really be part of that team. It, so, it, it goes back a little bit, I think, to what I was talking about as the loan sharks having to prove someone has to be the, uh, the test case, the model of getting their knees broken so everyone else will pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's in prison, too. You know, if, you're not shown, if you show weakness, then someone will take advantage of right. you. This mentality right. that if America shows any weakness, right then other powers are going to take advantage of that weakness. It seems to be at, at, almost at the core of U.S. policy because they, it, it keeps ending in debacle. Yes, and it, it needn't be that way. I mean, at this precise time that they're digging their heels in on grounds of toughness, a whole new countercultural and, and anti-war movement is developing that is challenging the, this uh, idea of masculinity and rejecting sort of the John Wayne image that they had grown up with. And, um, coming to the conclusion that maybe it's really braver and tougher to express a kind of moral courage that can uh, can say no, this is wrong, and and we really need to withdraw. And there there were uh, occasionally some people uh, cl close to power who were were starting to say that, and they would immediately get sort of shut out. I mean, they they were saying, for example, that you know, yes, it might be as George Kennan, one of the great architects of the policy of containment, said when he was called before the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee to testify. William Fulbright was the chair at the time, and it was widely televised. So George Kennan was asked, uh, "What what do you think would happen if we withdrew from Vietnam?" This is 1966 again. He said, "Well." Honestly, I think it would be a six-month sensation, but it would, it would blow away. It wouldn't really have any fundamental effect on our um, national security and it actually, in terms of our uh, international reputation, might Im improve it. So one of the ironies of this period for me is that Johnson, who was always credited uh, as being a master politician who could read the tea leaves and count every vote, completely miscalculated the direction of the American uh, public uh, because had he withdrawn, early in his presidency, before the massive escalation, I think he, he might well have been reelected. I think he could have made the case that this really was not in our interest and, and not so much a sign of weakness, but of, uh, of, of really pragmatic uh, realism. And there's another irony, all these guys prided themselves on being hard-headed realists who could see the world with steely eyes and un, uh, 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 unaffected by sentimentality or or uh, namby-pamby moralism. And yet, you know, in the face of the evidence that they were receiving on a daily basis that the, the war was going poorly, that they had privately very little optimism that they could achieve their uh, objectives, certainly not in any time soon, maybe five, 10, 15 years down the road, that those same pragmatists were willing to uh, care, continue uh, a war they knew they weren't uh, winning because they didn't want to be seen as weak, didn't want to be the first president to lose a war. But then doesn't Johnson at the end, <clears throat> near the end of his presidency, he does come to the conclusion to try to end it and, and, and negotiates a, a, in secret a ceasefire that might lead to a final settlement that gets torpedoed by Nixon. 
Yeah, he does make some small steps in uh, that direction, though this, the, the ceasefire of the bombing in the north, first it's only above the 20th parallel, and then just days before he leaves office, it's all the way down to the 17th parallel, but he never stops the bombing of uh, the south. And one thing that uh, Americans to this day don't quite realize is that our bombing of South Vietnam uh, was far more intense and uh, unconstrained than the bombing of the north. We dropped four million tons of bombs on the south, one million tons of bombs on the north. That's a lot, but um, uh, the bomb, South Vietnam became by far the most bombed country in world history. We were using B-52 bombers that contain, could hold each one of those planes 30 tons of bombs. They, of course, have been designed to drop nuclear weapons, but were retooled to be used in Vietnam. Uh, but again, on the south, within 25 miles of Saigon. But doesn't Johnson, <clears throat> Johnson does negotiate a ceasefire, right? I mean, a full-scale ceasefire that, that never takes place because Nixon talks the North Vietnamese into, into withdrawing. Well, no, he, he continues the, the war. He, 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 what, what I think maybe you're alluding to is he does an, um, uh, initiate peace discussions the sort of the Paris peace talks, which do slowly begin in the last year of his presidency, uh, though the South Vietnamese president, uh, Nguyen Van Tu, wanted nothing to do with them. But this, this idea of having balls and showing American power, um, in spite of the war starting to unravel, um, but there's also economic interest here. I mean, there's a lot of people making a lot of money out of the war. It's true. Uh, certainly, uh, defense contractors are making bushels of money, but uh, uh, one of the interesting things is that over time, by the late 60s, uh, high-level executives are beginning to believe that the war is actually uh, hurting the economy because it's... Uh, or hurting them. Uh, yeah, well, they see the... Their section their, of the economy. Their, yeah, and, and um, defense industry aside, um, there's a, a moment in which the CEO of the Bank of America, no less, goes before Congress and makes the case that uh, the, the war is bad for business, that uh, uh, corporate profits have actually uh, peaked in 65 just as the ma massive escalation began and, and it had declined steadily since then and that inflation was ticking up. And so uh, he, he really is calling for an end to the war. And yeah, it was an interesting part of your book. You talk yeah. about how because unemployment gets so low, right. inflation starts to go up, corporate profits start to go down. Right. So you have a, a real division, I guess, within the American elites about those who are still making money out of the war right. and those who aren't making as much money as they right. want to be. Or, or, or people who are ideologically committed to the war, even if it doesn't necessarily support business. So it's a... It is an interesting uh, period, but it does suggest how broad-based uh, uh, opposition to the war was by 1970 and 71. And for some of our younger viewers or people that forget, uh, let's just remind people this isn't just a, when someone wants to continue a war because they want to pull their organ out of their pants. They want to prove how tough they are, prove how tough America is, was. T just remind us again how many people suffered and c were killed in the war. Well, we, the, now the best estimate for the number of Vietnamese, uh, uh, the, the Vietnamese say that 3.8 million were killed uh, during the American phase of the war. And uh, former Secretary of Defense McNamara, before he died, said he has every reason to believe that they were correct. Uh, American historians tend to say that it was at least 2 million. So it's sort of that's the conservative estimate. So we don't actually know the, the proper figure, but when, when you include the fact that we were we were also bombing Laos very heavily and Cambodia. Uh, you, you can add roughly another at least a million and a half to that total. So this is a real bloodbath. And for the United States, uh, certainly more troops were uh, lost than uh, at any time uh, after World War II, more than 58,000 and of course uh, hundreds of thousands uh, wounded and many more who suffered psych psychological casualties uh, from that experience. One further cost of the war that is not always noted is that uh, after the war ended in 1975, uh, many um, Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians have died from uh, unexploded ordnance. Roughly 2% of every American bomb that was dropped or even artillery shell doesn't explode. 
But, you know, so 10, 20, even 30 years later, a farmer can be plowing his field and hit one of those things and it can go off. Or a little a child can pick up, they had these really small baseball size uh, bombs that were called cluster bombs. That they would come inside a large conventional bomb and then when they exploded, they would send out these small, smaller bombs. And in, inside each one of these small bombs were hundreds of little steel pellets or dart-like, they were called flechettes, that would go in every possible direction, uh, designed as the classic anti-personnel weapon that would, that would kill people but not structures and that would burrow into your body, not necessarily kill you, but require other people to take care of you or lead to a, a slow and horrible death. And as I say, a kid could pick up one of these little baseball bombs and it could go off again. So, the estimate now is that some 40,000, anyway, um, Vietnamese have died from that cause since the war, which is extraordinary, and many more wounded. And when you look at American media and this narrative of, of American exceptionalism, the real victim of the Vietnam War was America. And right. we're going to get into the America as victim narrative in the next segment of our interview with Christian Appy on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. <laughs>